Hey, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being with us here today. Um, I think it's time, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, yeah, thanks for your interest in the RISE program and the systems diagnostic tool. Um, we're excited to, to share a bit more about the diagnostic today uh, and answer your questions. Um, one quick bit of housekeeping before we get going is that we are recording this session um, so that you know others can can watch it in case they find it useful. So just be aware of that. Um, all right, so before we start, let me uh, quickly introduce myself and my uh, colleagues on the call. Um, my name's Jason Silberstein. I'm a research fellow uh, with RISE, affiliated with the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford. Um, and part of my work uh, has been developing the, the systems diagnostic from an idea uh, into a practical tool for the sector. Um, so, uh, Marla, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Marla Spivak. I'm the research manager of the RISE program. So um, I work with the team that Jason was, was describing that he's on, um, sort of synthesizing messages from, from across the different teams um, of RISE. Uh, and I'm also a research fellow at the Kennedy School, so I'm actually based in Boston. So if anyone else is joining from the East Coast, good morning. It's a little early here, but excited to be with you all. Thanks, Marla. Gemma, uh, go ahead. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Gemma Knights. Um, I'm a program coordinator on the RISE program, and I am based and work from Oxford Policy Management, which is based in the UK, um, and it's the organization which kind of RISE runs out of for the most part. So. Great. Um, all right, so um, let's get going. So first uh, today, we wanted to give you some uh, background, both on the diagnostic and, and why, why RISE has launched this bid for small grants. Um, uh, then I'm going to um, hand off to Gemma, um, who's going to talk about uh, kind of the, the um, project management and application process to kind of complement what's already on the, the bid website. Uh, and we're hoping to talk for about 20 minutes overall and leave plenty of time for your questions um, in, in the second half of uh, today. So, yeah, first I just wanted to um, give a brief overview of RISE uh, in case you're not familiar with RISE. So RISE is a um, research program seeking to understand education systems uh, and why there is a learning crisis in many current systems uh, and kind of what we can do to address the crisis. So uh, RISE does this through, through three streams of um, activities. Um, first, the RISE has a lot of original research. Um, we have seven country teams, which are in orange on the map here, um, and some other uh, cross-country teams that look at the political economy of education. Um, and these research teams are, are largely independent, but tie back to a kind of RISE systems framework. Uh, second, uh, RISE has a synthesis team, uh, and, and this is the team that, that Marla heads and which I'm part of, uh, and this is where the diagnostic sits. So um, this uh, synthesis team is, is trying to kind of bring all this research produced by RISE together uh, and ask, you know, what have we learned overall and how can we translate what we've learned into um, tools for, for the education sector. Uh, and the diagnostic is, is obviously one of those tools. Uh, and then third uh, rise in the, in the last few years has been cultivating a community of practice, um, which is dozens of like-minded organizations um, who um, are exploring you know, what it means to take a systems approach to education and, and learning from each other um, about uh, efforts to address the learning crisis. Uh, so you're very welcome um, if you're not already a member. Right, so um, 
I wanted to uh, give a, a quick kind of genealogy um, of the diagnostic, kind of where it comes from. Um, so the, the diagnostics has its roots in a framework from the World Development Report 2004, um, which uh, proposed some core accountability relationships um, for service de delivery uh, across multiple sectors, not just education, um, and kind of how service delivery could be improved for the poor. Um, you, you might know this report from the accountability triangle uh, graphic that, that came out of it. Um, so then two, uh, early in RISE, around 2015, um, this uh, framework from the World Development Report was adapted by research uh, director of RISE, Lant Pritchett, uh, specifically it, to, to analyze education systems. Um, and many RISE papers and, and outputs since then have tied back to this RISE framework. Um, and then three, in the last few years, we've been uh, starting to turn this, uh, you know, uh, framework into into practice. Uh, turn this framework into the diagnostic tool, um, something that you can actually do to better understand education systems. Um, so, pre-COVID, we um, piloted uh, the did the first pilot in in Ghana, um, and currently another pilot is getting underway uh, in Uganda. Uh, and then four, um, that brings us to the present, to, to the small grants. Um, and, um, you know, RISE launched this bid for a few reasons, um, but, you know, one is to do more pilots um, in a shorter period of time as, as RISE, um, uh, you know, as this project continues. Um, and we want to see also the diagnostic um, adapted and, and are really seeking to experiment both in who applies the diagnostic um, and in what um, um, purpose the diagnostic is applied for. Um, and then, you know, another reason I think is, is to really match kind of supply of the diagnostic with demand for a diagnostic. So we're very much not um, looking for opportunities to just do a diagnostic exercise for the sake of doing a diagnostic exercise, um, but are hoping to find, you know, what moment and what context uh, a diagnostic will be useful in and, you know, RISE is not the best place to recognize those opportunities. That's really where we're, we're looking to all of you um, through this small grants opportunity. So, um, great. All right, so in the next few slides, I wanted to uh, very quickly um, and at a high level uh, go through the, the kind of core, um, the big idea behind the diagnostic um, and, and um, what it tells you. So, you know, the, the, the biggest idea is that um, education is a system. Um, and basically that all actors in that system are embedded in it uh, and, and that shapes their relationships and shapes what they do. So um, you can see uh, the teacher and students at the center of this slide here. Um, and you know this relationship is at the center of the system in a lot of ways, right? This is where learning happens. Um, but both students and teachers are embedded in the larger system. So, um, to change this relationship, uh, you could just go straight to interventions involving the teacher, um, you know, something like teacher training, but a, um, a systems framework and perspective would argue that that's missing all the other stuff that's influencing teachers. Um, you know, teachers are pulled one way by the curriculum and they're pulled another way by the assessments. Uh, they're pulled another way by students' learning levels. They're pulled another way by uh, district level bureaucrats who are kind of monitoring and in inspecting them. And so uh, the basic intuition is that, you know, we need to look at how those parts fit together, um, how, how they can constitute a system uh, and not just zoom in on one part uh, at a time if we want to change things. So the RISE uh, diagnostic offers a kind of systematic way to describe the education system. Um, so uh, it's 
grounded in four, these four kind of macro relationships um, in the system. The first one is politics, which is between uh, citizens and the state. Uh, the second is compact, which is between the, the state and the state executives um, and uh, line ministries and, and other education authorities in charge of education. Uh, the third relationship is management, which is between um, uh, usually line ministries um, and schools. Uh, and then the fourth relationship we call voice and choice, which is the direct relationship between families uh, and schools. Um, sometimes that's called the, the short route of accountability. Uh, and then the second dimension of the framework uh, describes each of those relationships and breaks them down into five elements. So uh, there's delegation, which is defining uh, the kind of educational uh, purpose or, or setting goals. Um, there's finance, which is what resources are given to achieve um, those goals. There's support, which is what help or, or especially what, what training is, is provided to achieve those goals. Uh, there's information, which is how progress towards those goals are measured. Uh, and then there's motivation, which is how um, meeting the goal or not meeting the goal uh, kind of matters to those who are, who are tasked with accomplishing it. So if you put uh, the relationships and the elements together, uh, you get this uh, five by four, um, you might have heard it referred to. So uh, the four columns are the relationships and the five rows are the uh, elements. Um, and so what this lets you do is kind of zoom out um, and look across the rows and across the columns and recognize coherence or incoherence between the different parts. So, you know, are the parts of the system working together or not? And are they aligned to uh, learning or not? Um, so the gears here are illustrating one uh, kind of simple example of this kind of, um, um, how this kind of thinking works um, and looking just within the management column here. So just to go through this example, um, you know, the, the delegation gear, uh, the green gear, uh, you know, is saying, oh, maybe in this hypothetical system, the, the ministry expects schools and teachers to prioritize uh, foundational literacy for all students. So that's a pretty sensible learning uh, oriented goal for many education systems. Uh, then the, the green support gear is, is saying um, in this hypothetical system, there's also coaching offered to teachers to actually um, uh, achieve that, that learning objective, that learning goal. Um, but then when we look at the assessments in the system, the yellow gear in the information row, um, we see that they only happen at the end of secondary school. Uh, they don't match the curriculum and, and they are used just to select the best students. Um, and so these assessments are not aligned with learning. They're, they're aligned for a different purpose, maybe uh, selection. So um, the you know, key kind of insight that this kind of systems framework and systems thinking can offer is that you know, this is an incoherence that might be preventing uh, learning. Um, and so this is, this is just a simple example of the kind of uh, kind of um, systems um, thinking or systems inquiry that the, the, the framework allows you to do. Okay, so um, just to clarify now the the overall purpose of of the diagnostic. What are we? What is Rise hoping the diagnostic um, will be useful for? Um, well, as, as the previous slide was alluding to, it's really to apply systems thinking in two different dimensions. You know, first of all, how well are different parts of the system uh, working together and how well are, there, are those parts of the system working together uh, to prioritize and deliver learning? Um, and the idea is to use the process of, of doing the diagnostic to build a shared understanding of the system um, within a specific audience uh, and then 
try and prioritize concrete ways to, um, uh, to make the system more aligned to learning. Um, and so again, we're, we're really, um, RISE is not just looking for grantees and partners to, to do the diagnostic. We're looking for grantees and partners um, for whom, you know, this, this purpose of, of the diagnostic makes sense and, you know, fits with their existing agenda and, and demand for this kind of thinking, um, you know, for, for the audience that um, a grantee or partner has. So it's not just an exercise for its own sake. Uh, you know, the real question is how will the diagnostic and um, a systems perspective be useful to an existing project or program or, or policy? Um, for partners, we're hoping this will be a, a real, uh, you know, learning partnership with RISE, um, an opportunity to access uh, the RISE network, uh, thinkers within RISE, researchers within RISE, um, research that, that RISE has done. Um, and we really want to work together to improve the diagnostic tool with you. Um, you know, for, for RISE, this is a great opportunity for us to learn from you uh, and ask, you know, is this tool useful um, in what context, in what moments, um, how can we slim down the tool? How can we focus it? That, that kind of thing. Um, and then just to say a few things that the, the diagnostic tool is not, um, it's not meant to just be an exercise for donors. Um, it's not meant to be a data gathering, um, um, exercise. So a lot of times people see our use of the word accountability and, uh, and I, and think about data. Um, but actually this is a much broader, um, you know, effort or exercise than that. Um, and uh, lastly, yeah, the, the diagnostic is not easy. It, um, you know, the definition of the system that it suggests goes beyond the ministry school relationship and really involves um, you know, many other parts of the system, like for example, ministry of finance or politics or communities. Um, so um, the diagnostic involves talking about some hard uh, or, or political questions that, um, sometimes in, in the sector, we um, don't talk about that much. All right, and um, lastly from me, um, I wanted to just talk th through a few uh, potential um, use cases or, or applications of the diagnostic that, um, that we, we see. Um, but I should caveat this whole slide by saying, you know, one of the, the main reasons for running the grants is to discover new and kind of novel um, uses or applications that we rise haven't thought of for the diagnostic. So, so these are just um, ideas to get you thinking. It's not some kind of exhaustive list of, you know, these are the only things you could do with the diagnostic. So, um, like I said before, we're looking for a diversity of possible partners. So we've listed um, some of those in that first um, column, uh, organization types. Um, and then there's a few different applications um, that we at least have imagined. Um, you know, so to look at, for example, the, the um, possible application with implementing organizations, um, the diagnostic might be useful if you're an implementing organization thinking about a new program uh, and kind of how to design that program so that it lands um, with the other existing parts of the system. Um, or maybe you're looking at a past program that didn't go so well and you want to ask, okay, well, what, um, what were the parts of the system that this past program were incoherent with and which kind of limited its um, you know, either uptake or, or success in which um, the diagnostic might, might help explain why um, that program didn't go so well in some, in some circumstances. Um, to take another example, you know, looking at um, how the diagnostic could be used by government and advisors to government like consultancies or, or even think tanks. Um, you know, I think the diagnostic definitely lends itself to moments where government is agenda setting, you know, and trying to set um, new priorities. Uh, so kind of these, these high, these moments of high level uh, strategic planning is, is certainly one possible 
place and, and moment when the diagnostic can be used. And that's kind of where um, the, the pilots in, in Ghana and Uganda um, have, have, um, have come in. Okay, and just to say again, you know, this is not exhaustive. We, we want you to adapt the tool um, to local contexts and local problems. Um, and we want to work together to figure out the best um, moments to, to, to use this tool. So this is just to inspire you. Um, great, with that, I will hand over to uh, Gemma. Thanks, Jason. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to run through some points relating to project management and our ways of working. Can I get the next slide, please? So we expect each that we expect that each project team is going to be different. So what project management is going to look like for each of you will kind of vary across the board. Um, but we do have the same responsibility to each of the grantee teams. So you can expect uh, some consistency from us, depending on which team you're on. The things that everyone can expect from the RISE team will be um, high level grant management and admin oversight, full training on the diagnostic framework with some example uses of the instrument for you to build on, feedback on your progress, delivery and, <coughs> and your milestones, um, and any other support is needed. The RISE team is also going to facilitate um, activities relating to your learning and to our own community. The support from the RISE team will be facilitated by myself. So just to reiterate, I'm Gemma, I'm the program coordinator, um, and also from my research fellows, Marla and Jason, who you've seen both on the call, and also support from uh, the learning, the research director, sorry, Lant, who some of you might already be familiar with. There are some responsibilities that fall to each grantee team, um, and these include developing and utilizing the relationships with your counterparts, adapting our diagnostic framework to suit your context and project, developing further tools or instruments for your project as needed, and the day-to-day -day implementation and delivery of your project and milestones, which does include participating in regular admin meetings, feedback sessions, and community events as they pop up. The project team is also expected to be sufficiently staffed. This means that as well as appropriate researchers, there should be an allocated project manager and administrative support. These positions are required to maintain the smooth operation um, of the project and to ensure coordination with the RISE team in a collaborative way. But obviously you need to build your team to suit your project. The slide just shows an example of what a sufficiently staffed team might look like. Next, please. Um, so just a few points on the timeline of the pilots as well. You've got until the 22nd of November to complete and submit your applications. We're gonna complete our evaluations of all of the applications um, and start making our selections by December 13th. So that's when you can start, we can expect to start hearing from us. To make some allowances for the holiday period, um, contracting is going to take place over January. So we're looking to have the contract start by February 2nd. Uh, at that point, we're going to begin the training and preparation phase of the project and teams will, can develop their inception report, including the project plan, timeline and budget. You can see the outline of the other project phases on the slide. Uh, regularized check-ins will take place each month with all grantees, and these can be an opportunity to share progress and also discuss any challenges that you might have encountered during that project phase with other grantees. We're looking for all of the projects to finish by the end of July, 2022. And this means the project is gonna run for six months, by which time all deliverables need to be submitted and completed. So I'm just gonna run through a couple of points relating to the application now. Um, next slide, please. So just to reiterate those key dates again for you, you've got until the 22nd of November to submit your applications. You can start, you'll start to hear back from us by the 13th of December. The contracting process will run throughout January, so contracts can start promptly at the beginning of February. Um, if you've already had a look at the RISE website at the small grants page, you'll see quite a few documents there for your information. Um, so just to run through what a couple of those are. The pre-qualification questionnaire is there as a requirement that's passed down from our donors. It also includes some questions which are going to help us speed up the contracting process for successful grantees. We request some information relating to your type of organisation, as well as things such as different levels of different insurances um, that you'll need in order to work with us. Um, that's dictated by Ox Policy Management, who would be the organization that do hold the contract. Um, it's not to say that if you don't meet these requirements that you're disqualified or that you can't apply. Um, it just allows us to start having that conversation about what steps you might need to take in order to work with us. And it gives us an opportunity and some time to get those things sorted out. So if any of the questions do raise an issue for you, please reach out to us via the email address on the slide there. 
um, yeah, just at the bottom, sorry. In the relation to the actual application questions, feel free to format your application however you want to. You can answer the questions as they're laid out in the application questions document or in any other way that feels appropriate to you. Questions one to eight do require written answers, whereas nine and 10 can be provided as annexes to your application. Uh, we've also posted our selection criteria online in order to make the application process as transparent as possible. To reiterate a point that I think Jason made earlier, the standout detail that we're really looking for um, grantees to make in their applications is just a demonstration of how the diagnostic tool is going to be useful. And this can be useful to your counterparts, useful to the wider education system and useful to your organisation. We're looking to see that your counterparts have also been thoughtfully selected in order to meet a need that you've identified in your education system. And it's also worth reiterating another point that's made a couple of times throughout the terms of reference, and that is that the fees and expenses um, that you'll be allocated if you're successful in the grant are, need to be split 50-50. So this isn't flexible, unfortunately, so please do keep it in mind when developing your proposal. And just to explain that a bit further, um, the full grant amount will be between 66,000 and 82,500, depending on how many successful applicants there are. So if to say it was 66,000 is the full amount, 33,000 of that will go towards staff fees, and that includes staffing, researchers, management, and your admin staff. And the remaining 50%, so the remaining 33,000, will cover expenses, which covers things like travel, hiring out spaces for workshops, and just other reasonable receipted expenses that you can expect on a project. Um, yeah, I think that's everything in relation to the documents. So please do reach out with any further questions via the email or in the Q&A session we're about to have, if you have any relating to the application. Um, yeah, we're really looking forward to receiving all of your applications and thank you so much for listening. Wonderful. <clears throat> Thanks, Gemma. Um, all right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see everyone. Um, and yes, the, the rest of the time is for your questions and um, hopefully our answers to them. So um, I see that folks have started posting in the chat, which is wonderful. So you can either put your questions in the chat and I'll um, try and take them as they come up, uh, or you can raise your hand and, and I um, can call on you uh, and you can say your question to everyone. So. Um, Yes, and sorry, if I miss a question, um, please also uh, shout out because sometimes it's hard to keep track of the chats here. So, okay, one question from um, Aksa. The full grant amount is uh, per organization or the overall amount available? It is uh, per organization, yeah, per organization. And the kind of variability there is, is um, depending on how many grants we, we eventually give out. If there's fewer, it will um, be a little higher amount. Um, Hannah Mae Wilson, it's great to see your name. Uh, thank you for putting <laughs> your questions in the chat. All right, let's see. Uh, the first question, are grantees expected to implement or test the entire framework or um, can you concentrate on parts of the framework? Yeah, good question. Um, you can absolutely pick and choose um, parts of the framework and, and focus um, um, on certain parts of the framework. Uh, but I would say it is still a balancing act uh, in the sense that, you know, what, one of the big strengths of the framework is as a systems framework and looking across the different parts of the system. Um, so we wouldn't want to kind of deep dive into one um, very specific part of the system, we'd still want um, the, the proposal to kind of make connections between different parts of the system and, and, and um, yeah, have that kind of systems level um, um, insights or, or findings at the end. Uh, but no, you don't have to kind of religiously fill in every uh, relationship and, and every row kind of thing. Um, Great. Uh, Debbie has a question. The link to the application questions online is to the TOR. Can we update that? Um, sorry about that, Debbie. Yes, maybe I can ask Katie or Lily if, if you can look for a better link to the application questions um, or, or just to the project page overall, which I know lists both the TOR and the application questions. Um, 
Great. Um, one more question. Oh, Marla already answered Debbie's question below in the chat. I see that. Thanks, Marla. Um, <laughs> Uh, Hannah May, again, can you um, describe the extent to which grantees are meant to test the framework through uh, a research-oriented activity or whether uh, you're also expected to use the framework to improve practice? Yeah, um, that is also a good question. I would say <clears throat> the, you know, the, the, the diagnostic is designed and we're hoping it will be less of a I mean, it's not a research activity, really. It, it's, a, uh, it's meant to inform practice. I think that that's the primary goal. Um, it's meant to be used and useful. Um, I think there are qualitative research skills and you'll probably want folks with qualitative research experience on your team. Um, but the bias here is not towards producing, you know, great, great research it's really towards producing useful insights that the um that that your particular audience um um get something out of great um i'm looking for hands if anybody wants to raise their hand uh please do and i will call on you otherwise i'll keep going through the chat here. Um, all right, uh, Mary, uh, good to see your name as well. Um, can you please explain uh, how the tool applies to CSOs? Um, hmm. How, <laughs> I think there are multiple ways, um, you know, uh, a, a civil society organization could use the tool. We're certainly hoping that um, to, to get a number of applications from civil society organizations. Um, I, I don't know if I could, um, I mean, I think, yeah, I'm not, I'm trying to think if there's a specific, I don't think there's a specific, you know, application or use that we would be looking for from a civil society organization, but just to say that absolutely we would welcome applications from CSOs. Um, Marla, did you want to come in? Yeah, just uh, only because I had thought about this a little bit before. And what I think, first of all, we'd welcome any application that you could think of where this is totally not prescriptive. Um, but one thing that I thought about was that it could be interesting to use the diagnostic as an agenda setting tool and strategic planning tool for the CSO. So sort of an analysis of the system with the goal of thinking about where civil society can intervene, how civil society can intervene, what priorities should be. Um, so like an internal, more internal planning. Um, and then another would be to think about, you know, a CSO using its convening power to just do the diagnostic with other stakeholders that are important to them in the system. So sort of a consensus building um, exercise among a number of stakeholders you know, if your organization is positioned to be sort of a convener and a leader in that way. So those are just two ideas that I had when I thought about it. But um, as Jason was saying, we're really open to, um, you know, new ideas and, and suggestions from applicants. Great. Thanks, Marla. Um, um, Mary Garetti, one other question, um, your second question on how many grants in total are we planning to award? Uh, Gemma, can I pass that over to you? Sure. Um, so I think for the total amount that we have, we'd be looking to probably assign four or five. Um, I think five is probably the maximum we can. Um, yeah, which is unfortunate because we, we've got quite a lot of really amazing people on the call today. But I think, yeah. Four or five is probably the number we're looking at at the moment. Great. Um, and then um, third question, uh, six months of implementation sounds very short. Um, can, can that timeline be extended? Uh, yes, that's a good question. Um, we could consider, I, I believe, extending the timeline past the July 2022 um, date mentioned on a case by case basis, but we're we're hoping to stick to that timeline. Um, and 
I guess I would just say that, you know, th this gets back in some ways to Hannah May's question in that, you know, six months is certainly too short to do a great um, uh, piece of, of research, but potentially uh, not too short to kind of, um, um, uh, yeah, it, have, a, have a different kind of purpose in mind, which is to develop some kind of insights into the education system and develop some consensus around those insights um, in a targeted group of stakeholders. And so, um, yeah. It, it, it is short, though, and we would be willing to consider, um, you know, reasonable extensions on a case by case basis. Great. Um, I still don't see any hands, but team, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, okay, so next question from uh, Highwell. Um, Sorry for pronunciation. Uh, we're a large state university in Indonesia, which specializes in education. Um, you have good links with the Ministry of Education and education institutions um, across the country. In principle, is this the sort of organization um, that we're looking for? Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I think, um, you know, uh, universities, uh, could absolutely be be um, good partners and grantees, um, and in particular, if, like you're describing here, if you have good pre-existing relationships and links with, um, you know, policymakers or you know at the national or subnational levels, and you think that, and you can um, give a rationale as to why why this um, diagnostic process will help them, and um, then yes. I think uh, that that sounds very promising. Um, another question from Aksa: Are for-profit organizations eligible? Um, Gemma, this isn't actually something we've um, excluded from the TOR, so I can't see that there'd be a problem with it. Um, I think it really just goes back to a point we made during the presentation: if you're able to demonstrate how it will be useful. Um, then any organization can apply. Great. Thanks, Gemma. Um, all right. Question from Mary, um, uh, who is from a civil society organization um, working in partnership with multiple institutions and uh, designing a model that addresses unemployment problems in East Africa and Kenya in particular. Um, so you've tested this model and want to introduce it to um, to others. Does this qualify for the grant? Hmm. Uh, I would say, you know, the grant is specifically for uh, taking, adapting, and implementing the RISE diagnostic. Um, so, you know, we could discuss more um, offline about, and, and you could think more, you know, does, does this model um, that you've developed or this um, uh, intervention that you've developed kind of, you know, how could the framework and, and a systems perspective and a systems diagnostic help you understand when your model might or might not be effective in a particular context in Kenya? Um, but the grant is specifically to do uh, some version, some adapted version of the RISE diagnostic. Um, so you have to connect it directly to the diagnostic and think about how the diagnostic would be useful. Uh, all right, um, a question from Rediet. Um, is it okay to focus on part of the system uh, or a specific level like primary or TVET only? Uh, Yes, it is okay to focus on part of the um, system or a particular level of the system. In fact, um, I, th I think I would uh, encourage that in some instances, um, but I would caveat that by saying that the, the framework um, and, and most of RISE's research is, is oriented more towards basic education, um, meaning primary and perhaps secondary education. Um, we haven't looked a lot and the framework is not particularly suited for TVET um, or it hasn't at least been built out 
to to answer questions around TVET. So, um, you know, I think TVET involves um, a lot of very specific actors that that um, the framework and at least the the tools that we've designed so far aren't kind of well adapted to yet. So, uh, yeah, that's what I would say. Um, Great. Uh, question from um, Oludel. Sorry, Oludel, if I'm saying your name completely wrong. Um, asking, besides the application questions, are we expected to sum submit a research proposal? Um, Gemma, can I ask you to clarify that? Sure. Um, so I think, as Jason said throughout the presentation, this isn't expected to be a piece of research. Um, so you wouldn't be expected to submit a full research proposal as if you were going to research in order to collect data. Uh, we, are, we have select, um, put some application questions on the website, which should be accessible now. I think we've had the link updated. So if you have a look through those, um, you can either answer them in the document as they are, like question by question, or you can formulate your own uh, proposal to, get to the grant that way. But it's not expected to encapsulate what a piece of research would look like but you do need to answer those questions so I hope that's helpful um, and I can also take the next question as well if you like Jason yeah, please please yeah from Hannah May um, on how the budget should be allocated so if you were awarded the 66,000 let's say um, this will be split unflexibly 50% on staff fees and 50% on expenses um, so yeah that, that is how that needs to be specifically split out. So the 50%, the so the 33,000, for example, um, would have to go towards staffing your admin staff, your project management staff, and your researchers. And then the other 50%, the other 33,000 um, needs to be spent on project expenses. So yeah, sorry, sorry, that can't be more flexible, but that is unfortunately passed down to us from our donors. Thanks, Gemma. Um, great. So. Um, Rafiula um, has a question, is a newly formed organization eligible um, to apply? Um, you have experts staffing the organization with um, rich experience, but the organization is new. Um, yes, I don't see why not. I think we would welcome an application from a new organization. Um, Again, you, you might want to just um, spend, make sure you spend time in the application kind of justifying um, the, the relationships that you're bringing to your particular audience um, and who you're hoping to kind of um, influence or, or um, help with the diagnostic. And I think as long as, you know, you're, you're bringing folks with those pre-existing relationships, then, then that's fine. The organization itself doesn't need to have a, a track record. Um, yeah, anything to add to that, uh, Gemma or Marla? Um, I think just going back to a point I made about the pre-qualification questionnaire earlier, um, it might be worth just having a look through that document and seeing uh, that you meet the base minimum levels of insurance. So you're, if you're a new company, you might not have had certain insurance taken out yet. Um, it's just a requirement from the contracting organization. So I would just recommend having a look in there. And if there's anything you're unsure of, please just reach out and we can um, try and figure out how to get those levels for you. Yeah, good point. Um, Red yet, can, um, another question, can we uh, adapt the diagnostic to special education? Hmm. That is a good question. I, <laughs> How to answer that? I I would say you you could, um, but uh, and that would be extremely interesting. I think it would be it would be ambitious in the sense that, um, like I mentioned before, the the uh, main kind of um, the the diagnostic and uh, you know the the overall framework and then the specific supporting tools and instruments that we have designed so far and which would we would be kind of offering as a as a basis uh, to grantees and partners um, to to riff on and adapt on those have all been uh, made with basic education in mind and so there would just be a lot more adaptation to do and 
with the fixed budget and limited timeline, I would be, yeah, uh, it would be hard, but I'm not ruling it out. Um, great. Let's see. Um, okay, another question from um, uh, Dewi Sasanti. Um, so you're an international NGO partnering with several organizations in different countries. Uh, the framework would be very useful for your partners. Would it be possible to submit a proposal that covers more than one country uh, or should you identify a country to pilot the framework um, and, and see how you know that pilot might be useful for the wider network? Hmm. That's a great question. I Well, uh, again, I'm not ruling either one out, but my bias would be towards your second idea of identifying, you know, a, a more um, uh, defined and, and um, context, you know, may, maybe that's one country where you pilot and see how um, the diagnostic tool can be used and then use that as a kind of a proof of concept going forward, um, just because of the, again, you know, the limited nature of the budget and the the limited uh, timeline. Um, but that's not to say, you know, if if you, if you have this kind of cross country project or or inquiry underway that you think the diagnostic could be um, appended to uh, and kind of um, used to. Um, to, to, to lend more insight into, I mean, that, that's another possibility. That, that's another kind of frequently asked question we have is whether the diagnostic can, um, can be kind of added on to an existing um, project or, or policy um, under consideration. Um, and, and the answer is absolutely yes. And we do recognize that, you know, the resources and time that um, you know, the, that are in the, the grants that are attached to the grant are limited. And so if you, can identify a, um, an opportunity where the diagnostic is complementary to an existing project, then maybe this kind of cross-country um, level of analysis becomes possible. So yeah, hopefully that's, that's useful. All right. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Are there any, any hands? All right, one more question has come up. Great. Um, are we expected to implement the framework uh, or is uh, the call focused on how the framework will work? Uh, it is to both adapt and then implement the framework. So yeah, there, there is um, definitely an expectation involved of, of imp implementing um, and, and trying out the framework uh, in, in practice. <clears throat> uh, good question. Great. Um, all right, well, as other questions are percolating up, we can, I, I can turn to a few um, kind of fre frequently asked questions or, or questions that were submitted um, in advance of this event and, and perhaps just cover some of those if we haven't already, but please jump in either on the chat or with a raised hand if a new question occurs to you um, because we do have a few more minutes. So, Let's see, um, one question that was submitted in advance of this event was, um, who will the participants be uh, in the diagnostic exercise? Um, and we just wanted to clarify that the project teams are free to choose, <clears throat> you know, the particular uh, actors within the system that are relevant to the particular uh, relationships um, that, that you choose to focus the the exercise on. Um, so there, there, there's not a kind of prescribed list of uh, participants that would be um, that would be 
very much, you know, up to you and adapted depending on the, the question that you're hoping the diagnostic will help you answer. Um, let's see, that question we've already answered. Um, that one we've already answered. Hmm. We've actually, we've gone through most of these already. So that's great. Um, Okay, one question on um, how are the findings going to be disseminated? That, that's another question that's come up a few times. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we are very much hoping that the findings of the diagnostic will be public um, uh, eventually. You know, if that is sensitive for you or your partner, um, we can talk about uh, ways that the full findings and you know uh, details of the diagnostic aren't publicized and maybe we focus instead on on the kind of process of organizational learning or, or how you adapted the diagnostic um, and and we can try and and respect um, you know parts of the findings that might need to be confidential for example for for uh, you know government uh, uh, audiences often uh, it may take a long time or they may never want to release some, some findings. Um, but yeah, so the, the parts of the findings that can be publicized, um, you know, RISE would be very excited to, to use our platforms and uh, networks to, to disseminate those. So, you know, our website, our newsletter, social media, uh, the community of practice uh, kind of, webinars and events. Um, we are planning a public event kind of at the at the end of the grants process where we do try and pull together, you know, what have we learned about how uh, across these different pilots, uh, the diagnostic can be useful. Um, and would would certainly encourage, uh, you know, our grantees and partners to to publicize the findings themselves. Um, and, you know, we can, we can look at publicizing blogs or some kind of more substantial uh, um, kind of findings um, as, a, as a Rise branded uh, kind of product. Um, all right, I think, I think we've covered the other substantive and operational questions that were submitted um, before the event. Um, so no, I would just encourage you to look at that. There is the uh, FAQs, Frequently Asked Questions, which is posted uh, on the project um, uh, bid site alongside you know, all the, the application materials and, and questions. So do check those out. Um, and Unless anyone speaks in the next minute, uh, I think we will end there. Um, but just to say thank you so much for all your interest and, and really excited to receive your ideas and, uh, and work with some of you. Thank you. <laughs>